Go ahead. Right. Um, good morning, Dr. Baby. It's an honor to have you here with us today. Um, I will begin with your with a short introduction for our audience. Um, Dr. Kiran Bedi is an Indian social activist who was the first woman to join the Indian police service and was instrumental in, in introducing prison reform in India. Not only this, but she served in the United Nations, was a national tennis champion, and was also the Lieutenant Governor of Puducherry. With the diverse hats she has worn throughout her life, we hope to find out more about some parts of it through this interview. We are grateful to host you in collaboration with the Institute of South Asia Studies. I'm Shipranch, I'm the Director of Outreach for Speaker Series in Jaipur. Uh, thank you, Shapranj, and I'm Preksha. I'm the Director of Diversity and Inclusion at Speaker Series India at Berkeley, and it is truly an honor and privilege to be speaking with you today, ma'am. Uh, just to outline the interview structure, we're going to start off with some general question about Dr. Bedi's journey and eventually delve into the specifics about her career, her leadership roles, and uh, her reflection, depending on where the conversation takes us. And the audience is also going to get an opportunity to ask their own questions in the Q&A towards the end of our event. So we encourage you all to listen in to get a chance to ask thoughtful questions and contribute to the conversation later. So um, in honor of Women's History Month, which started in March, we're especially grateful to be speaking with you today, ma'am, as you have been one of the most influential leaders in shaping the systems of India, along with being an important role model for women aspiring to contribute to the Indian workforce. Which brings us to the first question we have for you. Uh, as the first female officer in the Indian police service, were there doors that you specifically had to open that are now more readily available for women aspiring to join the force in India? Uh, Preksha, when I joined the Indian police service, there were no doors. <laughs> they were all walls. Yeah. They were all walls. And there were mental walls. Mental social walls where it was considered that women is not good for uniform. Mm. So uniform and women never went together. Yeah. Bridal dresses went together. A lot of jewelry went together for women, but not uniform. So they were wa mental walls. And I was not aware of the mental walls because I would, had been breaking the mental walls right from childhood when I was playing competitive tennis from the age of nine onwards. So I was breaking through the walls. But I didn't know I was breaking through the final wall. So when I joined the Indian Police Service, I myself did not know that there were no women in the Indian. I didn't search for it. There were no Googles. There were no Googles. Where do I find out whether there are more women? Call up the UPSC? I didn't. So when I offered this as my first preference in the Indian Police Service, I wanted to do it. One of my batchmates, a friend who was studying with me in Punjab University, Chandigarh, he too was sitting for the UPSC. And he filled, he said, why are you doing this IPS? Kiran, what are you doing? I said, I want this. He said, no, no this is not there. <clears throat> he didn't tell me there weren't more women. So they were all mental walls. And of course, mental walls by the society, the systems, because they were not properly welcoming. Even if somebody strayed into it, they sent them, they sent them packing. I believe some women wanted to join. They sent them packing home saying, no, this is not meant for you. Yeah. But they tried to do this with me too. They wanted to pack me back too. I too was called by the then union home minister to say, are you sure? But that then union home minister was Mr. Casey Pant, and who was a tennis friend of mine. And he was the president of the All India Lawn Tennis Association and he knew I was not going to uh, go back to the tree. So I said, and then he said, then you're welcome. But they did give me an option to say you can move into something else, but rather than this, and do you know what it means? I said, sir, I understand what it means. I think that sports background in my MCC background, I was already breaking walls. So that's how it was, it got broken. And when I was in the whole batch of 1972 at, in Masuri Academy, and I was called by the union home minister from Masuri, saying, come and meet the home minister. And I was, I went to Delhi from Masuri. The entire batch of 1972, the IAS, the IFS, the IPS, saying, don't, don't give up. We want you to stay on with the service. So there was a great, a great enthusiasm that somebody was breaking a wall. And it was breaking a wall. I think after that, the floodgates got opened. Yeah. 
You have now women who even retired as director generals of police. So the, I think the whole wall got demolished. It just vanished. Now, yes. after me, if anybody who opted for the Indian police service and now wanted to change their mind, they did not allow changing of the mind. Yes. Right. Yes. Thank you so much for that answer. It's definitely really inspiring because you have paved the way for many women in one way or the other. Like even if you didn't know at that time, it's your determination that really has changed the structure of how Indian systems work. So we're really grateful for you for that. So yes, uh, okay. Shipranch. Um, so a, a kind of follow up uh, to that answer. Um, was there a specific moment or experience that you had before joining the force that, that motivated you to get into this line of work? Shupraj, there were not a specific moment. There were moments. Every day I saw around me how discrimination was prevalent. Gender discrimination was prevalent. I saw because I was traveling widely with tennis in hand. I was traveling very widely all over the country because the competitive tennis took me to different cities. And I saw total prevalence of gender discrimination. And I should question it as why. And the why was because the woman doesn't have financial, she has financial dependence. She's not uh, uh, economically equipped and she's dependent, right? And she would suffer. And I said, this is not my life. My life is not about suffering. My life is about independence, space, freedom, decision making and my own growth and then i realized that if how will i be able to do this if i'm not empowered myself so i just saw ra writ large disempowerment writ large in my gender and also no choices so there were not one moment shipranch it was moments whether it was traveling whether it was cycling, whether it was playing competitive tennis, even in competitive tennis. As a girl, I was given half the cost, my travel expenses, than the boys did. I was so badly discriminated. So imagine, the, um, even the tennis people, when boys were boys played on the court number one, and the girls' final was on the last court. I saw discrimination. So I was a witness to almost a daily discrimination just because of the gender. The only thing was my own home was saying you are, you are who what you want to be. So that's where the whole brainwashing happened or the cleanliness happened that you, while you're seeing discrimination, you have to demolish that too. So it's I saw it in not one moment. And I also saw my father being approached for help in, for justice. And I realized that if, if you are not empowered, how would you give justice to others? You'll suffer injustice. So I grew up actually in an environment which was very visibly discriminatory and um, as a woman, as a second citizen and also disempowerment because of no finance and also mental, mental setup. My every, it was a, totally a male, it's a very, very, very strongly patriarchal. Patriarchy. I actually grew up seeing all this. That is what increased my, I didn't hate it. I, it increased my sensitivity to responses. So it made me more compassionate, more empathetic. It actually it made me grow and evolve and not say condemn, not complaining. Neither was it condemning, nor was I complaining. I was growing up to take this on. Right. That was the difference. Yeah. That, that's a very unique perspective I've, I've never heard. Um, that, that take on uh, patriarchy for. Um, so ma'am, given the path that you took in your career, yes. should bureaucrats eventually join politics after retiring? And is it possible to remain neutral while, when in service with the thought to lean towards a particular ideology later? Or, um, and like, furthermore, do bureaucrats make good politicians? There are two, three questions in your question. Let's break it up. And they're very valid questions. Let's break it up. I think you've got two, three sub-questions. Right. First question, first, your first part of your question is? Um, should bureaucrats join politics after retirement? That's, that's your first question. Should bureaucrats join politics? Let's look at politics. Is pol are you looking at public life as politics? 
or are you looking at electoral politics? You got to clarify for me. Are you looking at electoral politics? Or are you looking in public administration where a bureaucrat enters? What's in your mind? Um, so my, my thought process was more like, once the bureaucrat has um, experience in public administration and uh, logistics surrounding that, should they should they venture into electoral politics and like uh, represent uh, political parties and um, ministerial positions? That is what Rajya Sabha is meant for. Right. See, if, they, if the bureaucrats obviously will not be public faces, they won't get, get votes because they're not in the streets all along from the age of right. They're not social activists. They're administrators. And selectively, the country can need that kind of very valuable administrative experience. It's a very valuable experience. Look, the, most success, the success of the India's foreign policy is Mr. Jay Shankar. And he was a Indian Foreign Service officer. All through from the young age, foreign service. Look at the kind of experience he's got. Thereafter, when he was became he became the foreign minister, look at the way India has benefited by his amazing experience of almost 40, 40 years. So he didn't fight go, go into electoral politics. So that's why Rajya Sabha enables you, enables the party in power who is looking for that kind of experience. We also have a railway minister. We have an information technology minister. Brilliant, he's an IS officer retired, who was chief secretary elsewhere. He's come with a wealth of experience for railways or information technology and given huge amount of integrity. And there's the, in this current budget, so much of investment has gone into the railways. You see, when the government of India invests into a particular ministry and positions the right kind of administrative acumen with integrity, the country prospers. Now, Rajya Sabha is the route. Now, the question here is before, are you, can you be neutral before you enter? That was another part of your question. Right, right, yes, ma'am. See, you can, you can have, every one of us, we are all political animals. And we live in a democracy. We have our views, we grow up with our ideologies. We go grow up with our theories, philosophies, beliefs. We are atheists. We may be religious. See, we all have our beliefs as we grow up. And everybody is different from that point of view because parenting is different. Schooling is different. Environment is different. Neighborhood is different. Books are different. Teachers are different, right? Our reading material is different. Our cinema, what we watch, our cinema, we traveling is different. Our holiday is different. So we all acquire these kind of experiences. But question is here, the challenge is, can a public servant, while being in service, remain neutral? I think that's where the, the, that person's quality emerges. Is he, as a person, justice-oriented? Is he lawful-oriented? Is he conscientious to the job he's got? If he's conscientious and justice-oriented, he will put aside his beliefs and deliver justice. Right? He may be on the left of the center or right of the center, or center of the left, depends. So that's one. That varies from person to person. If he's a weak, tempted, tempted man looking for postings, transfers of his choice, housing of his choice, right? He will not be neutral. He will align himself. I've had that experience in my Pondicherry. I had a chief secretary who was totally aligned. He was totally aligned to the the uh, the composition in power totally lined why why because the chief minister is writing his annual confidential report and he wanted to be the next promoter to the secretary level and he totally aligned he totally became a doormat it's written in my book fearless governance so i'm not saying it now for the sake of saying it i've had this experience he aligned himself with the party in power he was aligned himself before that new part, new government uh, composition. Prior to that, he was totally aligned with the earlier chief minister. Then the moment new government came in, he totally switched role and became a friend of the new chief minister. The reason was annual confidential report. See, he gave himself to the annual. For him to become a secretary or the highest level was more important than delivering what was uh, objective. So it varies from person to person. I've seen people take on, but that that population is getting shrinker. It's getting it's getting shrunk. Where that time for them, more important is promotion. 
right. posting, secretaryship, or director generalship, DGPship. So secretaryship, DGPship, I think that's traded off. So you, it's difficult, I think, but it's a big challenge to be neutral. But after that, I, all I can say is, it depends on the government leader, political leadership of the how much he wants to deliver. And they will choose the team, like the current prime minister has chosen the team. And he's chosen some of the pick of the bureaucrats who were very knowledgeable. I, I mentioned railway minister, information technology minister, power minister, foreign minister, and even, even finance minister. She was an academic. So it varies from person to person. Everybody's not picked. But after all, if the lead, a political leader has to deliver in the country, he has to choose a team. Right. And the better the team, better the delivery. And that's why integrity is becoming integrity with professionalism and accessibility and transparency. All this is happening with many, many of these bureaucrats who are communicating very well. Thank you very much, man. That's that's very helpful. Um, uh, yes. So, ma'am, just because you touched on your experience as the Lieutenant Governor of Puducherry, we just, uh, I just wanted to follow up on that and ask, how did you specifically transition during the shift from being like an IPS officer to the governor? Like, were there any challenges that you faced personally? And were there any changes that you had to make in your own uh, working style during this shift? Well, you got also three questions in one. <laughs> I yeah. think they are all very valuable. Let's break it up into three. The first one was, how was my shift? Right? Yes. Second, yes. Third was, yeah. how did I change my lifestyle? Third, in between was very interesting. How did I take on the challenges? Yes. All three are very, very loaded, very uh, interesting questions. The first one is, how did I expand my role from the Indian Police Service to administrator? Yeah. I think the IPS prepares anybody for good administration because Indian Police Service is leadership. Indian Police Service is team building. Indian Police Service is strategies. Indian Police Service is training. Right? It's all about training. It trains yes. people. After all, you're heading a force of sometimes uh, thousands, lakhs of people. Lacks of people. So therefore, what are you doing? You are a leader. You are a team builder. You are a trainer. You are a you are a visionary. You are a, you are steering the steering the ship, and you are all the time strategizing, and you are grooming leadership. All those qualities are there as in the Indian Police Service when you are a leader of that force. And the best part of the Indian Police Service administrative leadership is that it teaches you a great deal about discipline. Discipline. Only thing which is missing in that leadership sometimes is communication. Because the Indian police service doesn't communicate much. It's not so much of community policing. The leader doesn't, why he shies away from the media, lest the media puts words in his mouth and creates a confusion. That's the only thing. But that was my strength. My strength was communications as I was in the service. All along with my service, I was a communicator. And I learned this communication as a tennis player. Again, you're all the time interacting with media from the age of 14, 15, 16, 17, because you're losing and winning matches. And the media is coming back to you, how I felt losing, how I felt winning. And you are in the papers all the time. You're not shy. You're not into publicity. You're into communication. So I think that was the only, that was the additional strength which came to me as an administrator. All the skills which I mentioned to you traveled with me. And now my scope was policing plus education, um, healthcare, right, finance, all this came. It was all about team building. Now was the challenges, how soon can I do, do a good team building? And I was a good team builder. Actually, I'm a product of teams. I'm not a product of individual performance. I'm a product of very strong teams I built. Wherever I went, whether in the policing, anywhere. First thing was find out who are the credible, reliable people. That's what I did. In, in, and that's where the change happened. And who were my team members? All the locals. They were all Tamilians who knew. And they were all those uh, serving officers 
uh, Niti Das, if you read my book, Fearless Governors, there's a chapter called Team, Raj, team Rajnivas. So the Team Rajnivas were just a, a good, good, group, good group of six people, Niti Das, Sridhar, they're wonderful people, Asha Gupta, they were great people who knew the work, who knew, who knew everybody. Why do I start from a scratch? I don't know the language. I don't know the culture. I don't know their rules, their, their ways of working, their preferences, their, their festivals, right? How do they deliver? So I immediately went about picking the tube. My predecessor had said, Kiran, I'm leaving a very, he was general, uh, a general who I succeeded. And he said, Kiran, I've left a team for you. You may choose when you go back. And I chose it as it was. The only thing I told them was, I trust you. Till you belie my trust. See, the trustworthiness, once I passed it on to them, and of course, worked with them, led them, showed them the way, gave my experience of the North and my experience of these policing leadership, et cetera. Uh, my prison work, my policing, I think, came in very, very handy. Very handy. How I, and my even my NGO work, because that had expanded uh, the horizon of my work from uh, bureaucracy to community working. And that's what I think community working with bureaucracy and administration was a perfect combination. And they loved it and we delivered. So I think that's where the team building heard is the challenges. Oh, I was used to challenges. In the policing, I had a lot of hostility. In the, uh, in the Indian police service, I great deal. So how did I deal with hostility? Where it happened in uh, Pondicherry was great deal of political hostility because you are now hitting the money bags. When you deliver with integrity, there are people, vested interests in organized people who are used to getting their commissions, who are used to getting the cuts. And when I start to closely look after, because as an administrator, I had those powers. The difference between full governor and a lieutenant governor is this. Lieutenant governor is an administrator. And a full-fledged governor is a constitutional, is a, a ceremonial portions, but little bit of those discrete. Mine had full scale. The files had to come to me for approvals. Service matters, financial matters, contracts, policies. Everything came to me. The approval had to come to me. So I start to look at closely lots of money for commissions. And, and then, of course, Government of India policies helped a lot by doing direct transfers. That's where the conflict was. And they took me to the court for everything. They went to Supreme Court, they went to high courts. So along my administration, I had to deal with legalese of challenges in the courts for all, most of the critical decisions. And the government of India backed me up because I was implementing as an administrator, as a representative of the president of India. So hostility, but in that hostility, my team was the real shock absorber and was an advisor. And trust in the team actually saw me through completely. In fact, they are the best friends I have, I had, and I still have. So I think as a leader, your past experience, your own integrity, and your own skill, and your team building, and trustworthiness, and empowering people, power of delegation, all this was coming from the police service. So all mm. this came very, very handy, and along with personal discipline and hard work. IPS cannot be without discipline and hard work. So I gave a lot of hard work, a lot of discipline, <clears throat> and leading by, 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 by the, from the front. Indian police services leading from the front. They were not never led from the front, visibility. So I think all these qualities helped me neutralize. If you're really keen on, any one of you is keen on, its book is available even on Kindle, yeah. Fearless Governance. It's an amazing documentation of hostility management, team building, and uh, how I led from the front by various excellent practices, all team building. So mm -hmm. I think this is what it is. Whatever you're experiencing as youngsters, whatever you're learning right now, all this is building you up. Remember that. It's building you up as you become CEOs, et cetera. All this is going to come, and that's why more experience, more upskilling, the better you will be growing every day. So that's what I did upskilling, regularly learning, and remaining sensitive. I remained empathetic to entire team. I was, in fact, my best friends were always my juniors, not my seniors. Juniors, because they were getting recognition and they were getting team building. They were getting empowered. 
they were getting delegated, they were getting trusted. And they stood by me thick and thin, thick and thin. And then not my seniors always, they were exceptional seniors who stood by me, not all. The reason is very simple, not that I was not uh, capable, they had their own priorities. They had their own preferences. They had their own issues of envy. The competition, where seniors start competing with you, that's a terrible thing. Mm. And in policing, it's discipline. You know, you can't go back and talk. In the corporate world, you can have a chat, saying, can we have a chat? In the policing, you don't have a chat. There's a hierarchy. Right. Yes. Whereas I allowed a chat, they didn't. They wouldn't allow me a chat. So this is how it is. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, we are also taught sometimes that involving um, local uh, people who are part of the change that you're making into decision making is is ideal. Um, moving on, uh, um, are there other motivations behind joining the IPS and the prestige associated with it the same as it was when you first joined? And if it isn't, then what factors do you think led to that change? I think uh, it's been a blessed uh, sustainability. I sustained my inspiration and love for the service. It was totally sustained. Why? Because I remained honest to the day. That was my nature as a student, being honest to, honest to what is before me. I think that habit of integrity to what is before you, and if I'm in uniform, I will give it all my, you won't believe it, it's, it's a very strange thing. I never took any, uh, any much of a leave from the service because I loved my work. For me, my love for work was so much that I didn't need to take leaves. I didn't need to take breaks. I loved it. I loved because I was constantly reinventing. So the inspiration was what's going to be new today? What am I going to do better today? The reason is that your juniors are looking up to you. How can you say I'm shutting your eyes? I'm shutting the door. Now you go what you want to do. I never did that. Why? Because it's like a mother. Mommy never goes on leave. Mom never goes on leave. I was like the mother in my service. I never went on leave because I had children behind. So they were not children. They were grown up to, uh, grown men and women. But I was a mother to them, even though if I was half their age. Because what does a mother do? Mother cares. Mother provides. Mother secures. Mother inspires. And mother teams up. Zeke takes care. I, I think I had a very strong motherly streak of care, compassion, empathy, grooming, training, providing for, and at personal sacrifice sometimes. What does a mother do? She takes discomfort to give comfort to the family. I don't know. I was born with these qualities and probably they kept nourished, but I reveled in them. It was not a pressure and burden on me. I think I reveled in those qualities. And it remains, so it's just a, till the last day, even as a governor, it was all along being the mother, mother provider. Fortunately, I was now the oldest, eldest in age because I went there retired and then I had a couple of years under my belt. But I think that motherly instinct or a parenting instinct, now let's look at it as a parenting. Now for mother, let's come to a parenting instinct where the father, the father can be equally the parent. I think I had a very strong parenting streak. And what does a parent stand for? That's what leadership is all about. Parent also punishes. Parent also admonishes. Also, only for the larger good. Parent never admonishes to punish and let the person go to hell. No way. Or a teacher. So it's a parent-teacher combination which has been my leadership style. And that's how it got sustained. Why? Because I celebrated all my birthdays with the police all festivals with the police. Never was my birthday not celebrated in my workplace, along with family when I would go back. So I think that's the way I enjoyed and that's what became the reason for sustainability. And in the process, I got so much of love. So much of love. Why would I not let, let it go on? Thank you very much, ma'am. For me, um... The parent in civil services becomes quite little. Um, but thank, thank you very, very much for that response. Yes, it's genuinely really admirable to see how passionate you are towards the service. And 
that you found something you really uh, engaged towards. So just on that note, we will now like uh, go into some specific career questions. So as we were talking about the police force, so as someone who has been a part of the police in varying jurisdictions, what do you want people to know about the police that could potentially improve a somewhat strained relationship between the gender public and the police all across the world? And also, how can we as citizens be better from a policing perspective? First part, just remember the second part. And let me focus on the first part. Okay. I think the way the policing functions is a lot depend on the political leadership. If the political leadership is going to be using a force, as happens in autocracies, as it happens in autocracies, not democracies, autocracies, the force is used. There's no question of any trusting relationship. You're using it as a strong arm of the government. So where's the question of policing? The point is, now let's look at in democracies. In autocracies, policing is an extension of the militarization or the autocracy, right? So there's no question of you trusting. It's a user relationship, okay? But in democracies, it's if it's really good democracies, then there is an element of rule of law. And the rule of law is executed by the police, where everybody is below, law is above, you're below and it's equal. And then there's independence of judiciary and there's an executive which neutralize, which, which, allow, which does not interfere in the rule of law. And there's a legislature which enacts the laws as needed. So in democracies is the real challenge of policing where it, there is a great scope for trusting relationships. And the ball is in the court of the policing. Police officers, senior officers from the beat level till the DGP level, need to connect, stay connected with the people and keep them in confidence. That means you're building up peace committees, you regularly have holding your town halls, so hold town halls, you have peace committees, right? You have student cadets, you have all kinds, you have research, you have an analysis. So you work as a great teams and you create teams at the grassroots to the top level. And you're constantly connected and you're using all tools of communication, including social media, to share with people the trends. Sometimes it will be very challenging, whereas terrorism. Then you create information systems where the people trust you. And you also have one of the important things which I did when I took over as Lieutenant Governor was to set up 1031 immediately as an open line to me. Before I even joined, I announced the opening of 1031. Any corruption, any violence, any organized crime, any land grab, please call 1031. You will be protected from any information. Can you believe it? I made it known. You will tell me if you have, and trust me. And it did. It worked. So I think these are the trusting few things which you can do and is opening up your lines to you, access to you. That doesn't mean that I'm breaking hierarchies. No, I'm sending a message that there's a rule of law. You dare not take us for granted. Don't take us for a ride. So 1031 became a remarkable open line. It immediately ensured confidence amongst the weak and the aging. And in Pondicherry, a lot of French citizens, Indian French, had living in Paris because it was a French territory earlier, and many of the Tamilians there got French citizenship and they were living in Paris and elsewhere. And they left their land and they were aging. And many of these land grabbers would grab their land with political support sometimes, and then just occupy the land and say, this land is ours. And involved with the local police saying, now this land is ours by, by muscle power. I was informed that this has happened. We got those lands vacated. We got those ruffians uh, arrested. So there was a, even if they were meant a physic, uh, politically supported from behind, and we also exposed the who was the nexus. So there were nexuses of organized crime and land grabbing, house grabbing. Personally, I've got many houses vacated. Through, it came through open house, etc. So what I'm saying is that this is the real uh, issue. What yes. was your second part? Yes. Uh... 
thank you for that like it's really nice how you genuinely took a lot of initiative like communication is definitely important but it was through your sustained initiatives that you actually were able to make change and i just wanted to ask for the key how can we as citizens be better from a policing perspective we love a law abiding yourself yes you can be better citizens by law abiding it today the biggest problem of crime is not just one is terrorism which is limited to areas is financial crimes cyber crimes i think the biggest challenge today is crimes on the information technology and the more educated you are the sharper you are in that cyber crime by hacking by hacking and this is into billions so it's no more into lakhs and crores it's billions where you are transferring billions from one 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 push of the button to the other i think the more educated we are the uh, the some of those people who are more educated are even bigger criminals mm -hmm. financial crime which hits the whole economy of the country or economy of a whole large section of society i think that to me small thefts etc is very minor or even small terrorist attacks are visible you get them on and you shape it right the real challenge today is financial crime cyber crime and some of these have gone to <clears throat> the best of the educational institutions <clears throat> but been totally dishonest reason being that they've not been groomed well they are ungroomed unscrupulous people who are getting uh, educationally skilled to rob people cyber or financial crimes cheating financial crimes both manipulating the accounts to me this is so you were you are saying what what could be the best is being 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 ethical 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 is a very important training which we must grow being ethical to yourself and what it is to be what is the price we all pay if we are unethical if you ask me by policing all along was so simple my administration was so simple because i had no two rules so when you have no two rules you enjoy your work but if you have two rules you're all the time worried and stressed out how do i manipulate and hide hide the lie because when you're speaking the truth you don't have to remember what you said but if you're lying you all the time remembering where did you lie and every time you're probably adding something so i think that's the key is grooming ethics ethical education must go along with professional skills because it's dangerous the biggest cheats who are dangerous are those who are maximum qualified in information technology or or in financial manipulation i think uh, they are the yeah. bigger cheats yes big definitely yeah uh that's something we really need to look out for and it's really unfortunate how it has been on the rise but for ethics i can like as a college student i have observed that we have really been trying to inculcate it with whatever we've been learning about because ethics are definitely really important and we try to take the better and as as much as we can so yes ethics is must you have i don't know but parallelly ethics classes is very and it's not a preaching ethics is not a preaching class i think role modeling you do a lot of case studies role modeling if you have this where will you where will you portion and how will you hide why don't yeah. you declare there's enough i think that's where i think we need to make our lives simpler and have minimum reasonable evaluation what is my threshold rest is giving and the best way of ethical living is giving learn to give and when you learn to give as a child as a grown up teenager you giving 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 earlier you can give time you can give energy you can give positivity you get get inspiration you give motivation you hold a hand as as you grow up you got, you got finances to give that's why i think it's a challenge for teachers how do you have constantly ethic classes everything is linked to the ethics even a thought process is ethical how you thinking is is an issue of ethics so i think ethical classes ethical even in personal relationships even in personal relationship what is your reputation you building about yourself as a person how trustworthy are you i think the key is how trust how do you earn trust how do you practice trust how do you live trustworthy if you notice all along i've used the word team and trust yes this yes. is it 
So how trustworthy are you as a person, even in personal relationships? This is what's happening in India today. My God, in India's crimes against women is all breach of trust. Mm. All untrustworthy relationships, where live-in relationships have, have had men butchering the girls because when the girls did, uh, wanted to walk away from a relationship or... So just, where is the trust? They've all graduates, did something done remarkable and they're butchering them by a knife into so many pieces and putting them on in a frigidaire and storing the bodies and then distributing and going into the wild to throw the, throw the body parts away. Where is the trust? Who taught them all the way? Why haven't they learned to be better persons, good human beings? So alongside very skilled, successful degree holders, are you trustworthy? Are you a good person? Are you giving? Are you a good friend? Are you a good son or a relative or a daughter? I think these are alongside we must learn. Otherwise, we are into a dangerous world. We have to create skilled, qualified, ethical human beings. And you won't go to wars if you do that. Peace will grow in your head. So I think that's the challenge. How do we grow, sow the seeds of ethics and peace in the mind while you're climbing up the professional ladders or the degrees? That's critical to my mind. And most of us who've succeeded in our lives, who've been happy in our lives, achieved a lot in our lives, served a lot, we were all who believed in ethics, practiced ethics. We were not hankering after positions. Positions came our way. A lot of positions did not, thinking came my way, but all came, became diamonds. The Inspector General of Prisons posting came to me by accident because there's nobody going there. And look what Raman Maxis, it, Raman Maxis Award came because of my prison posting. And I was ethical in that. Ethical in the such sense, I start to work with the prisoners to say they are here to be, be reformed, rehabilitated, and not punished. So I think that came from my in, in, innate nature. So innate nature is the stage. Why have I accepted your invitation is basically, you are at a very sensitive turning point. If you acquire these habits of giving, sharing, empathy, honesty, integrity, trustworthiness in your speech, thought, word, I think it will make a world a much better place because you all youngsters are going to be leading the companies, the governments, the policy making, the strategizing. You will provide peace. You'll provide harmony you provide giving to the world, friendships, networks. Yes, thank you so much for that answer. Trust and ethics are definitely really the most important values when it comes to the public service. So you touched upon how you uh, improve the prison conditions and you brought about a lot of reform in prison. So we would love to know more about that. Like, how did you go about that given the limited resources and budget India might have had during that time? During that time, the prison was run by a British manual. And the British manual, you know, the Britishers arrested India, not for reform, but to keep them in custody and wear them out. Wear them out. And minimum food, and there was no budget for anything. There was nothing called reform in the prison manual when I took over. There's no called reform. But there was only one line which I capitalized on. Sometimes when you read the manual, Carefully, you can pick it. If you're designing, designing, you're desiring something and you read the law, you read down the law, you find the word. And when I entered the service, uh, the prison inspector general, I knew I was going to make this into a reformatory because I was a reformer at heart. More than social activism, it's more of correction and rehabilitation, which is my nature, or reform. So when I entered the service, I told in the first meeting, my colleagues there, again, team building, told them this is no more going to be a prison. It's not a custody. It's now a reformatory. And I mm -hmm. use the word in India, ashram. Moment I said, ashram banega, so sab jene hasne lage, madam, aap kya kar rahe? Ye to hum toko maarte hai, prison wale to hum ko, they, kill, they beat us. And, they, and you saying, ma'am, ashram, I said, don't worry. We will create an environment by which it be an ashram. An ashram needs no money. Ashram needs only human intention. Ashram needs collaboration. Ashram means receiving aid, receiving support. So, Riksha, there was no budget for reform. The budget for education, festivals, even healthcare was very poor. 
mm. right? No clothing, the minimum food, which is insect infested. Food was insect infested, no systems of complaint and uh, being, being heard. So what did I do? All I did was connected with the publishers, say, give me used school books, you don't need them. Connected the schools in Delhi and elsewhere, you don't need old school books, give them to me, right? Old school books, libraries opened in the prisons, many libraries, all because of donations coming from publishers who put away their books and don't need them. So I opened from four or five libraries to 25 libraries into the barracks. Everybody had libraries and these books in the all languages and publishers donated it, right? Then came the books. Schools donated me school bags. I created a whole go down of school bags and gave them to literacy programs. So everybody studied in the prison. Everybody, and you know how many? Everybody, 10,000. So wow. 10,000 people were studying in the prison. All were according to not a crime committed. They were according to the literacy levels, primary, secondary, illiterate, languages, etc. So education, then the Brahma Kumaris, the art of living, the Oshos, all these came as, as discourses. Sports NGOs came, health NGOs came, NGOs, non-profit organizing. Then there was no corporate social responsibility, no CSRs. The Rotary Clubs came on my asking. Why? Because prior to that, I had been, I was an NGO myself. I founded the foundation. So I was working with the children of uh, uh, drug addicts who were, I was trying to educate. See, I, that, that aspect of my life came along with me in policing, as policing. So I was not a police officer in that. I was not being punitive, not punishing, but reformative and educating. Through education, through evening discourses and creating panchayat systems inside on self-management, creating leadership from within, not talking about crime, bringing in counselors, volunteers. So 200 NGOs. I created a whole model of prison management. By the way, this is written in the book called It's Always Possible. And this book documents the whole process of uh, reform. I wrote it as a Nehru Fellowship. I know because I thought I applied for Nehru scholarship as a postdoctoral scholarship, knowing that this work is not likely to be easily repeated. Because I invested so much of energy into this, so much of my work into this that um, and so much of originality and there was not written in the book anywhere prison manual didn't have and one line as i mentioned why i could do this i was not breaking any rules i was still following the rules and do you know what rule one rule was inspector general of prisons can't set the policy of prison so i made a media policy an education policy festival policy a panchayat policy i made these policies so now you say well inspector general can make there was another rule where when I allowed lots of books to read, there was a rule that inspector superintendent can allow a, a books, a transistors, pens and pencils inside the prison, unless prohibited. The word was unless prohibited. I used, removed the word unless prohibited. I said they are all permitted. So I sent books, pencils, transistor, radios, so that they can listen to the news and prepare themselves. So I think it's the way you read down the rules. All of this, it emerged to a level of 1,000 prisoners into a meditation program called Vipassana Meditation. And that what caught the eye of the CNN and the BBCs of the day and said, how can 1,000 prisoners sit together without guns around, nobody escaping, nobody getting at my neck and uh, being in total silence. But it emerged, I evolved it. It's not that I suddenly did it. I grew trustworthiness. Again, trustworthiness. There was a beatbox. There was a feedback box. Used to, I didn't have a radio. I didn't have a phone. So I used to have a mobile beatbox where they could complain. So I had so much of a finger on the pulse of the prisoners. They could write to me anything they wanted. And I knew more than anybody else. There was drugs being sold. Where sodomy happening? Right? Where's a communal uh, feeling? Where's a nexus of the organized crime? Where is drugs being sold? I knew through the anonymous box, which is a locked box, only I had the key. Every evening I used to open the box, empty it, get all the little letters. And it was a roving box. Anybody could write to me any day. You didn't have an email. I can't give you them that. So see, look, they were all zero cost budget, zero. And the model which evolved through my prison work was the 3C model. 
collective, corrective, community-based. It was collective because prisoners were involved. Corrective because that was the objective. And community-based because NGOs and prisoners and all, we all work together. Yes. It's very, very respectable how you changed the narrative altogether. Like, even though there seemed to be no scope to make any changes, if you, you really proved if you really want to bring about change and if you really care about it enough, it can happen. So we really admire that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Priksha. And your book, Fearless Government, Governance Recounts, how uh, you went about fixing a, a system that, in your words, is broken. Um, from your experience in different capacities in the government, what is the most effective way to drive change and um, reform a broken system? Shupranj, the uh, method is very simple. Before you tell others to do, do it yourself. So right. lead the way. If you're telling others to be honest, in, uh, practice honesty, integrity yourself. If you're asking others to be in the field work, Practice field work yourself. If you practice say, asking others to communicate and open up their doors, open up your doors yourself and communicate, right? I think, and if you are taking decisions, taking responsibility for your decisions, but decisions are not taken unilaterally, they're taken in collaboratively. After listening to the last man in the meeting, leadership is all about listening to the last man in the meeting and being the last speaker. You may have a plan in your mind because you are probably experienced and you know what is right, but give the others a chance to think with you. So openness, transparency, practice all that you're preaching. So don't preach, perform, demonstrate, lead the way, show the way and become a follower and become a follower when the, the team or the leader starts performing, then be a follower. Then be a recognizer. See that the person who is now living up to your empowerment or delegation gets the credit. You don't walk away with the credit. Many awards I've refused, Shipranch, I've refused in my life, which was individual. I said, no, this is my teamwork. Reward my team, otherwise keep the award. Asian Jyoti was being offered. Asian Jyoti, 1982. I was DCP traffic of Delhi when Asian Games, ninth Asian Games were going on. And I was being given an award of Asian Jyoti. I declined. I said, the entire traffic police unit has worked its butt off completely. Please reward these, the traffic police of Delhi, the Asian Jyoti. Give it institutional award and not give it to me. They said, no, we can't give it to the institution. They didn't think that on this. I said, then I don't want it. I refused it. And there are many individuals who got it. I didn't. Because for me, walking away with an award, which actually was a great team award, was not fair. So I think, the, and the st staff saw that. Rank and file, this is what they look up to. And the moment they see the leader is one of them, there as a, again, as a parent protector, as a guide, philosopher and guide, oh, they give their life to you. And I've had people who've actually given their whole self to me. They sacrificed so much for me. And even their families, even their spouses, they loved it. So when there was no need for them to work, go home, rest a little, don't come. See, again, these, this is the way. It's don't shout orders. Just go back and explaining, commuting. Well, you are a decisive leader, you can decide. You have to decide sometimes. You have to dictate, you even have to ask people because those are the cancers. They remove that, re remove that virus. So I used to do surgical operations as well, but largely they were minimal. So surgicals were minimal and collaboration was maximum and reward was maximum, recognition was at maximum. So I think as a leader, that's what is critical. And that's what happened in all my assignments, not only in Pondicherry, policing, crime prevention, anywhere. Even in my NGO work, it's all led. Now I'm taking a back seat, even my two foundations, the Navjoti and India Vision Foundation. I'm a backseat. My directors are full-fledged leaders. And I keep sending, and we're all on WhatsApp. I keep recognizing them and let them go. I think leadership must be transferred. And I have a habit of creating next levels of leadership and then taking a backseat. So somewhere you must know when to lead and somewhere you must know when to follow and when to recognize. 
step in and when it's tough decision be the first when it's decisions can be taken let them decide be there and if error is made with good, with good intentions no harm but if it's evil intention you committed a breach of trust you're not part of the team so out so you have to be firm yet and effective and yet be care if you press, give this mixture of soft skills and hard decisions both soft skills and hard hardware and software hardware is for hard work and soft skills is all for these humanity humane qualities then you are speaking the same language the office the team speaks the same language because you're all together on one wavelength but listening i used to do a lot of one on ones lots of one on ones with my colleagues call them one by one as left in governor sit with me tell me about your family tell me about your children tell me are you the right place can i do something more for you and it really helped me in covid times covid there were only one call away every colleague of mine junior or senior was only one message away and they did it otherwise we would not have achieved this i was on first name basis means they i knew they're not surname i didn't call them by surname i used to call them by their first name which is always called by relatives and parents you know by first name like i'm calling you preksha and shrant i'm not calling you agarwal i'm not calling you rumta it gives gives a different message when you that's more human warmth so i think human warmth in human connectivity is the critical aspect of uh, leadership concern yeah okay thank you ma'am yes. we, we can we can really uh, instill some of these values in uh, even teams that we work in yeah, at school now yeah, that was very helpful thank you ma'am Yes, that was really interesting to hear. And now, just to like shift the conversation a little bit, uh, we really want to touch upon your India Against Corruption movement because uh, we think that's really significant. So you worked with Mr. Ar Mr. K. Jriwal and Anna Hazare in the India Against Corruption movement, and then you and Mr. K. Jriwal became part of political parties with different ideologies. So what was it like working with someone with a different political ideology? and how did you find common ground to work together like was politics not a consideration at that point or did the change in ideology happen after that fact like how do different leaders work together we really curious to know priksha when uh, india against corruption was born it was few of us and uh, the issue was commonwealth corruption in 2g scam in other society and uh, all across and the commonwealth games Kalmadi was heading. Mrs. Sheila Dixit was in Delhi. There was a lot of rampant corruption complaints. Two G scam. All these. Adar Society was a housing complex in Maharashtra. These four were making headlines all the time. And when you would open the newspaper, it was all about corruption. And nobody was registering any FIRs. Complaints galore, but no enforcement. Policing wasn't. Policing wasn't registering. So I was approached by these two, three people to say. why don't you join us because i used to come on television channels on corruption at that time and used to i was a regular evening debater was a panelist in many times i had the time so i could spend time explaining my views and when they approached me saying kiran can you help us get an fir lodged in parliament street police station against the against kalmadi on commonwealth games when i was approached by anazar's team and i was uh, then there were just few of us and he said i said i could not say no and i did not say no. because this is all what i had been saying all along that we must have rule of law so i i had my right network i went to the police station with them and i rang up the acp of that area i said why are you not registering why don't you take the complaint what is the problem <clears throat> make a daily diary entry recognize and acknowledge this complaint and they did and they did they took the complaint and they recorded it as a daily diary at least you are coming on police records sorry police uh, records that you have registered some information which has come to you from a citizen that is what brought the group together and we expanded from 3 4 to 16 then sri ravi shankar came baba ramdev came many others came retired people came and we became a group of 
anti against corruption and we started to now wanted corruption the 2g scam to be investigated we want the society to be investigated we want the commonwealth games to be uh, investigated we wanted the other companies. so we talked about anti corruption and at that time it was rampant it's a fact and i only became a part of it because that's what my conscience allowed me to. and i felt if i don't do this now what have i been talking about all along so i answered my own conscience i also knew it is a uphill battle mm -hmm. i knew that once i get into a movement it will take every bit of my min minute but i answered myself that what have i been living up for i was not politically inclined i had no political ambitions at that time everybody who asked santosh hegde also joined in right all these people all of us general vk sing joined us so we uh, anupam kher also joined us at some time so because this how the group of the, uh, the people known faces started to because of anna hazare anna hazare sat for agitation oh we all suffered a lot that uh, that movement was two years of every every bit of my energy was taken into this it was sun rain or shine we were into that and i took the twitter account and started to talk about anna hazare that's how i went to social media in 2010 2011 when i started to now speak about what anna is saying and took to twitter handle it said i had no idea about what it was but i did it and i started to learn my ropes but after that anna hazare's uh, thing it led us to some some process and i even went to the uh, mr arun jetli who is the bjp heading at that time i went to mr jetli i said mr jetli what we are doing as citizens is exactly your role you are in the opposition please take over this this is not ours please strengthen this this is your role as a political party we citizens are not um, they're used to this we don't know what to do we do, we are just talking about it but because of anna hazare and the fast it brought in lots of large congregations and we were talking the language for citizens and we were speaking their heart out so we were people loved us people just loved and admired and we got very high visibility not that we were i was seeking it not that i was seeking it i had enough of it already but but there was a turning point then came when we uh, when we got so much of visibility then came a turning point and there were some people in the other group who start to say oh and that was more mr prashant bhushan's father shanti bhushan who was a janta party leader and a minister of law during that time he suggested that this is what happened in jp's time also a movement came and this movement then turned the country's fate and it's it ought to be you can you can enter the parliament and now you can change the government he sowed the seeds of politicization or a political party of course in right earnest that india can change that's the time when we broke santosh hegde anna hazare and myself said thank you this was not the intention with which he did now rest is yours now and i had to walk away i did walk away i separated out and went back to my work i had nothing more to do but i continued to talk about the lokpal and the others group walked away with the entire facebook account of anna hazare all the donations which we had got all the data they took away and they never passed on the password to back to anna so anna santosh hegde myself and vk singh we all we, we separated and segregated out because i never said i belong to any political that was not my intention not my genes so that's where i separated i did not join any group at that time i went on back to my individual work my writings etc my work it's i had enough others then multiplied and multiplied and multiplied and you know the history rest is history uh, but the uh, fact is that they took away the entire facebook account the bank accounts the passwords anna kept asking give me my password give me my account i believe they did not anna did not get it so that's how we we split into two whereas that was not our vision when we started the anti corruption we thought we will be a vigilant pillar in this country independent non political a citizens voice as we grow that's what our vision was it was the vision was not political it came through this kind of uh, elder experience thinking that political root is he was maybe right i am not judging him i am not being judgmental but they thought the now long term change would be political so that's a political rule 
Then they found their own name for political party. They created their own uh, recruitments, et cetera, and they fought the elections. And they did very well uh, in the initial. Why? Because we had earned so much. We had won the hearts and minds of Delhi. So they took advantage of that hearts and minds completely, and they got swung the other direction. But now came a stage when the elections came, uh, then they said, who can counter Arvind Kejriwal best? Mm -hmm. Because I didn't like what he did. I didn't approve them of that because I had broken away. Even though he approached me to say, okay, you become the chief minister's face and we will work with you because you have that experience. And I said, no, that's not my bit. I can help you steer right, but I cannot be on political but I, because I'm for good governance. I'm for good governance. But the manner in which they developed fast enough, they were beyond my understanding. And it, I think a stage came when ethics was no more, more ethics and truth was no more the touchstone. And also I got cut off when they took away the Facebook and everything of Anna. And I said, that's not trustworthiness. I can't trust you. If you can do this with Anna, what would you do all, all along the way? So I then quietly decided. Then came who can counter him in the elections. I was one week, one month only before approached by Mr. Arun Jaitley. And I said, Kiran, can you fight an election? I said, sir, this is not me. I have neither any money, nor do I ask for money, nor can I go to raise donations, sir. I cannot do this. He said, but you belong to Delhi. Delhi has given you so much. Why not the time to give you back to Delhi? That was now a little bit of a soft, soft, soft cord. So my God, I start to think, yes, Delhi, I'm a product of Delhi. And I don't agree with what my friend is doing earlier. This was not the way we grew up. I was also inside angry. Why had this happened when we thought we'd be a pillar? So I fought the election for four weeks. I lost the election. And immediately after that, I went back to work. I never went back to any other forum because that was not me. So that's the end of four weeks of harrowing campaigning, harrowing campaigning. I, but experienced this, uh, this was very cruel experience. It was a very cruel, cru it was a cruel grind because it was like 22 hours of work every day. I lost my voice in between because my, our throats are not meant for this kind of a work at all. So this is the story of my friends. Thereafter, we I've never looked back and the other group moves on and you see them all over. And I'm on my side where I was truly. So I became my, back to my real self. Fighting election was not my real self. It was for a cause, for a reason, and on persuasion, and also on a soft cord saying, look, you know best, go ahead. And it's a fact that till the two, last two days of the elections, the uh, opinion poll was in my favor. Last two days it changed. Do you know how? They start to propagate. Ye pulsiya hai. Ye dande maregi. Ye pulsiya hai. Sare raat ko jara baje dukane band kar degi. Ye koi aapko wo chale wo pubs nahi chalne degi. Internet mein free dunga. Bijli pani free dunga. He started to do all these things. And people ask me, will you give bijli pani free? I said, it looks on the budget. Depends on the budget. If the money is available, I'll give you. Will you give us free schooling admissions? I said, no, depends on the school rules. See, I can't say, I'll give you my bijli pani, because that was not me. It was for not winning or losing. For me, I still even remained the same during my elections. But the credit goes to them. They had more capability. They had more organizing skills. And they went. But the point is, I did an, again a conscience duty. It was a conscious duty to fight an election for a cause of my city. And I also told Mr. Jaitley, Mr. Jaitley, I can't run politics. You can't do, do, do this uh, maneuvering. He said, no, you administer. We will take care of the other equations. So I said, OK. It's as long as it's administration for me, I'm OK with the rules and regulations. And I thought policing was with the, uh, we could do a great job and, because I knew Delhi. And they were like the back of my palm. The policing was what be with me. Policing was very happy, uh, would, would, would loved it because I was one of them. So that's how it is. That's the story of me and politics, electoral politics. So I never looked back on electoral politics. After that, I moved on. Uh, the next day, I lost the election. I was speaking to Harvard. I did, I did not cancel that speaking engagement in the Kennedy yeah. School of Governance. 
and I was reaching there. I went off to break away because I was not attached. Had I been attached, I would have hung on and went, gone back to enter it. I was not attached. I did a due duty and I'm glad I did that duty. I fulfilled the duty. I would never not did not lead the did not lead myself down. I was taking care of the, I took the risk, but I did not continue an error which was made. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, like irrespective of what happened, like it was just really nice how you shared your like very eventful journey so candidly. And irrespective of the outcome, just the fact that you was you stood so strongly with your principles is something we can all learn something from. So yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Brenda. Um, Madam, we will now uh, pivot into a audience Q and A, so the people, so the audience now can ask um, Dr. Kiran Bedi questions. If you would raise your hands, I can pick you, and then I'll be able to ask a question. I think we have a question from part of. Or you can unmute yourself. Um, seems to be a logistical issue. Um, Tanya, Tanya Tandon, you can unmute yourself now. Hi, ma'am. Um, thank you so much for actually coming out here. Um, I'm a recent graduate. I graduated about three years ago now from Berkeley. I'm now here in DC specializing in um, gender violence um, and just sort of trying to understand what gender violence looks like in India. Um, from your experience, of course, with your foundation, you've worked on rehabilitating women um, post uh, violence through self-help groups, but you've also spoken a lot about accessing um, the police for these domestic violence survivors and what that looks like because you know you've also mentioned that um, it's severely underreported people don't actually recognize the gravity of gender violence in India so from your perspective where do you see the police working um, with survivors to actually apart from making it more trustworthy from them um, but making domestic violence survivors feel safe and actually speaking to the police about their um, perspective and filing an FRI uh, to act upon the issue. Tanya, the, I don't think we have a very still an organized system on handling domestic violence mm -hmm. in India. We don't have an organized system. I do not know which best would be a model in any other country. Organized mm -hmm. system would mean to me having neighborhood counseling centers, mm -hmm. having a counselor in the police station, Mm. Having, a, having a call center as a counseling on domestic violence and then a nearby stay home yeah. which has a skill development and takes care of children so the woman will know if I have a domestic violence I call this number I can be immediately removed or a counselor would visit home mm. right or if need to be removal who, remo who gets removed man or a woman right and sometimes domestic violence also comes from in-laws, women right. versus women, right? Mm. I don't see any a system. It's a very expensive social system, but it's not in place. Mm. It's not in place in India where she can go. She knows which counselor I can go to, which counseling center I can go to, which is the nearby stay home. She searches for it on the internet and therefore she's afraid, afraid of even reporting. So she suffers. Women suffer. So I've noticed we don't have a system yet of domestic violence response. Maybe it's not reported. It's underreported. Right. And it's underreported because of the no trusting system. And trusting system demands a lot of, lot of investment of social welfare money. Not that India cannot afford. India can afford. But I don't think this has got prioritized. Yeah. So I would say that women who really have a problem, then they are driven. First of all, they go to the families. 
for domestic violence. Look at look at the recent murder cases where she suffered was the woman was suffering domestic violence. Did she report to the police? If she reported to the police, did the police take it up on an emergency? Did she know she can move on to somewhere else? Did she uh, and uh, could she predict the response of the police? No. Police also, I think, did a footsie. Did a footsie with NGO and NGO came in and come. They, they just played <clears throat> hide and seek. They never followed it up religiously. Had they done that, maybe that murder was avoidable. She was a sir, and she was an educated girl. She was living by herself in a living home. Many women in living relationships have suffered domestic violence, but are afraid to go and report either to the police or to the parents or to the friend once in a while gets on WhatsApp or Facebook. So mm -hmm. I don't think we have an organized system of a framework where it's accessible, callable, responsive, curative, and also providing a hope. I don't think we have. However, this is a level, but in the corporate sector, let's say, mm -hmm. you can go back to your company, you can see you are, you can ask for help from your senior and senior then connects with the police at the senior level and then gets help to counsel. So that means more psychiatrists, more counselors. We don't have a system yet. Organized, predictive. Thank you very much for Thank your you, Thank you. Um, Siddhi, you can go next. You can unmute yourself. Sorry, I think you're muted. Thank you, Berkeley, for organizing this session. Ma'am? My father has enrolled for this session. I have read your book, Idol. How sweet of you. And I really liked your book. It was a lovely book. Thank you so much. And so nice. Have, and you've spoken very well today. Thank you. Oh, so sweet of you. So sweet of you, baby. Thank you, Thank you mom. Love you. Love you. Me too, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think Mr. Rafiq has a question. You can unmute yourself. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Kiran, I was very impressed by what you said. Uh, in many ways, you have... Um, explain the principles of leadership that so many of us aspire to achieve in our business as well. And if I may say, I think you come across as an entrepreneur <laughs> to, to me, speaking in my business, from a business perspective. Um, my question to you is this, uh, as you have built this trajectory based on the principles that you've given us, uh, and you look today at the dysfunction in society, and now that you spend so much time in the US as well as having spent uh, so much of your time in Asia, um, how does the discipline, I, I mean, I, I also relate very much to you because I've been in the army as well, and I know exactly what you mean about working with the men. You sleep with them, you work with them, they will die for you. And that's what this leadership issue is all about. But the issue of today, where we have a diversity and a divergence in terms of thinking, um, where the rules are actually being bent, how do you feel it is possible to maintain this sense of character in order to prevent this from happening to the institutions that you really care for? And I'd love to hear your answer to that. Rafiq, we all have a foundation. We all grow up. Our parents are gardeners. They plant the seed and they nurture the sapling. What kind of nutrition do they give to that sapling is critical. And that sapling also is nutritioned by the teachers. Therefore, the school grooming up to at least the standard seven or eight is very critical in our value system. 
And that's where your foundation is made. And by the time you leave school and you enter college, you have entered it with a foundation. Rest is all experiential learning more and more. So I think the challenge here is grooming and parenting and teaching and the school. If your foundation of in all these value systems is in, has been ingrained to you convincingly and you have truly imbibed it and absorbed it, and then you, are, you will choose your subjects according to, to build on that. Once I, I accept that, no, I accept that. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I accept that. The difficulty we have today is an end result of a number of years of dysfunction. And Who's great dysfunction? Yeah, so now going forward, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so impressed by the young people I've heard today because they're absorbing that message and they are accepting it. But there are so many in society today who say, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. For them, it's certainty of punishment. For them, right. then we have to create systems of certainty of punishment. Right, okay, so got that it. Means once <laughs> they know they've done it, it will come soon and they will lose everything they had, the wrong means. We need to create those systems. Thank you very right? much for your response, man. Um, with that, we come to the end to this interview. Um, thank you again for your time, man, and your amazing responses. Um, I hope you have a great day, Dan. Yes, thank you so much, ma'am. It was really insightful, and we really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much. Trust we meet in person one day, sooner or later, but the web has done the trick. Thank you, yes. thank you ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Wish you all the best. May you be maybe all of you achieve what you've set out to achieve. And become icons of icons of brilliant grooming, governance, learning, skills, humanity. Main thing is humanity. Remember that. Be outstanding, good human beings. You are already skilled human. I don't need to inspire you for that. But value, ensure what nutrition you give yourself every morning. Mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual. All four, IQ, EQ, SQ, and your soul. I think internal upbringing is all yours you're not tested for that life will test you life alone life's incidences will test you how you groomed yourself skill you'll all be par excellence it's your life responses to life situations which will test you so I wish you well take take care of yourself and continue to nourish that mind body soul spirit thank you thank you so much ma'am thank you